In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, in the name of He who created the universe and all that is within it, hello and welcome to the third episode of Branches of Light. Today we will discuss about Imam Ali and um, it's the last um, of our three series program on Imam Ali um, Of course, uh, this outstanding figure in um, history is beyond description. We will, we will try to do our best to do justice um, on his part. Um, today we're joined by our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Takim, who's been kindly with us uh, in the past few sessions. Uh, Dr. Takim, I'd like to ask you about Imam Ali alayhi salam's um, opposers. Um, he, um, there was his enemies that opposed him and uh, there was also his uh, so-called companions that showed opposition to him. Uh, despite the differences in their motives, uh, they both had one common result, and that was chaos um, within the Islamic State. Um, so much so that the Imam had little time to accomplish the goal and uh, the government that he could have accomplished. Can you please uh, discuss some of the obstacles uh, the Imam faced during his five years of ruling? I think there were different and various obstacles there were three kinds of people to start with. Um, there were those who were his followers, the Shia to Ali, as they came to be called. There were those who deviated and left him completely from the very beginning. And there were those who claimed to be his friends. And then when he no longer served their interest, they abandoned him. So from the very beginning, Imam Ali salam had various kinds of difficulties confronting him. Then there was the legacy of the death of Uthman, which had created a major, what we may call civil strife. Uh, there were those who used Uthman's death in order to stir up trouble. They had deep-seated personal grievances against the Imam. Talha and Zubair, who were amongst the first to give him the bay'ah, the allegiance. And yet when they realized that uh, what they were expecting from the Imam was not forthcoming, in other words, the Imam was not going to favor them over others, that Imam Ali was standing up for justice and equality, which is the root of Islam, basically. They abandoned him, naqifun as they are called, those who broke their allegiances. And Later on, during the time of Muawiyah, and we can discuss this uh, later if, when you have time, inshallah, with the battle of uh, Sifin, we have a further rank which broke off for Imam Ali, the Khawarij, mm -hmm. who went to uh, unbelievable degrees to not only condemn the Imam, but even to call him a kafir, na'udhu billah. And these were the early, if you like, the fundamentalist extremist movement within Islam because they had adopted their own understanding of the message of the Prophet, okay. their own understanding of who is a believer and who is not. But that, as I say, these are multiple problems that the Imam confronted right from the beginning. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now watch a report together. Please stay with us. at the podium of the United Nations a person such as Kofi Annan can benefit a lot by sharing such um, an impressive human legacy with the rest of mankind when he makes a reference uh, to the letter of Imam Ali to Malik al-Ashtar as an ideal case towards which the whole humanity is striving to live up to those aspirations and implement 
the items the Imam articulated 14 centuries ago. Successor of Prophet Muhammad, Amir al-Mu'mineen, uh, basically the chosen one after Prophet Muhammad, when his successor was appointed, there wasn't many choices. There was fierce debate on who would be who would succeed him, and Imam Ali was the one who led the Shia Islam, uh, and he came through a very difficult time replacing Prophet Muhammad, but he succeeded. Very Sorry, I think I did it more than a sentence. Thank you for that report. Uh, we will now uh, move to the question about uh, the Battle of Safin. And uh, now uh, this, I think, is one of the most significant events that took place uh, during the ruling of Imam Ali al -Salam. And um, why is it that it took place, and why is it that um, his companions, uh, the Imam Ali al companions, abandoned him at uh, such a crucial time in the war? I think we cannot really understand the Battle of Sifin and the impetus for it, unless we look at what happened even the time before Imam Ali became the Caliph. In other words, these were all tied to the death of Uthman on the one hand, and also the desire of Muawiyah to remove Imam Ali from power and to uh, enhance his own personal ambitions. So though in order to understand Sifin, you've got to look at Uthman also. You cannot uh, separate the two. What is interesting is that even when Uthman was besieged in his home, and it's important to remember that Uthman's time saw the widespread appearance of nepotism, in other words, favoring your own clansmen, uh, your own relatives. So that created widespread dissension uh, and problems within the Muslim community. And this wasn't in one particular area. It was widespread in different parts of the Islamic uh, provinces. To give you an example, Walid bin Uthba, who was the governor of Uthman in Kufa, not only did he drink in public, he came to mosque to lead the prayer drunk. Mm -hmm. And yet, he, that is Walid bin Uthba, was not punished for it. Whereas we believe as Muslims, Allah is there for everybody. Nobody not even the Prophet, is above the law. This is just one example. There are other examples whereby the Umayyads or the clansmen of Uthman helped themselves, reached themselves, made themselves rich. During the time of Uthman, uh, there was widespread not only nepotism, but favoritism on, on one side. This created dissension on the other. And this led eventually to Uthman's death. There were other factors, of course, the Egyptians came and surrounded the city's home, uh, and when they were duped uh, into going back to Egypt and only to discover that the message or the instructions of Uthman to the Egyptian governor was contrary to what he had agreed to the Egyptians, that led uh, to the final uh, death of Uthman himself. What's also interesting to note here in connection with Sifin is that Uthman wrote to Muawiyah asking for help when Uthman was besieged. And Muawiyah came on his own and left his army behind. And Uthman says, well, why have you come here? I mean, I asked you, not for you personally, but with you and your army. Mm -hmm. uh, and Muawiyah said, well, I've come here, tell me what I can do for you. And Uthman knew very well that this was all a pretense. In reality, Muawiyah wanted power. And it was in Muawiyah's own interest that Uthman be killed. Because if Uthman was killed, then Muawiyah could claim to take revenge for Uthman and to upset uh, and to cause chaos and anar anarchy during the rulership of Imam Ali alayhi salam. So this is the background to the whole Battle of Sifin. Uh, after the Battle of Jamal, the Battle of the Camel, uh, when that did not work in Muawiyah's favor because Imam Ali salam, won the battle, what Muawiyah did, and I said these are all important uh, elements that we have to consider before uh, truly understanding the Battle of Sifin, 
he got the blood-stained shirt of Uthman to be sent to him in Damascus. Mm -hmm. And he displayed it in public mm -hmm. in order to stir the people into action, uh, to create uh, a sense of anger within them. It was also interesting to note the resentment and the hatred that Muawiyah had of Imam Ali. Because when he became the caliph, that Muawiyah became the caliph, he actually sent an order to his governors in different parts of the Islamic empire. And I remember this hadith because it struck me. What Muawiyah wrote was that, do not tire, don't ever be scared or tired of cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. And at the same time, always make sure that you promote the virtues of Uthman. So these were uh, the elements that led in many ways to the Battle of Sifin. When Muawiyah started preparing for war, he enticed one of his most shrewd uh, governors, a person by the name of Amr bin Az, to join him. And Amr's uh, response was quite telling. Amr says, Mas'udi has this uh, particular uh, statement of Amr recorded in his Muruj al-Zahab. He says, Lan tanalu min dini hatta analu min dunyak. Meaning that you will not get anything from my religion until I get something from your world. Here was a person, Amr bin Ahas, who was prepared to sell his religion for the sake of this world. People sell this world for the sake of religion, but he was prepared to sell his religion for the sake of this world. Uh, and Muawiyah moved his forces. For the first time we find that the capital of the Islamic Empire moves uh, from Medina to Kufa. We will discuss, we can discuss more about it later as to why Imam Ali moved the capital. But very briefly, this was because he got more support and he was, could relate to the people of Kufa more. Because the people of Kufa were the ones who were disillusioned, disenfranchised. They were the poor. And they found Imam Ali somebody who could stand up for their rights. Somebody who stood up for justice and equality. And therefore they promised him help, even though later on they abandoned him too. Uh, and as I say, that was when the whole battle uh, was about to take place. Imam Ali moved to Kufa and finally he was ready to confront Muawiyah at the Battle of Sifi. Thank you so much. You're uh, certainly skillful in talking them. Um and compacting so much of history in a short period of time. Um, stay with us while we watch uh, another report prepared by our colleagues. Well, Hazrat Ali Islam, of course, is the most important, uh, the highest ranking Imam, and in fact, he's supposed to be the second most important and ranking person in Islamic uh, religion after the Prophet. Uh, he is the fourth Khalifa of Islam and uh, according to Shias, again, the only difference between Shias and Sunnis is that he, we believe that uh, when we say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Ali Muhammad Rasulullah Rasulullah Khalifatahu Bilal Fasl that he is the wali of the Rasul, he is the inheritor and he should be the Khalifa after the Rasul. But I think these are not as important things as the importance of talking about their, his real qualities. Well, Imam Ali had a very important life. In fact, the UN has said that all Muslim nations should try to follow his example because he was such an amazing ruler, especially even though he, there was, he didn't get his, to be a ruler for so long, when he finally got to be a ruler for those, uh, that short amount of time, he changed the whole Muslim Ummah that had been corrupted for the past 25 years, uh, making it into a better place for all Muslims to live, and that's why he was killed because he was so just and fair and people didn't like that in him. Thank you for that report. Uh, we've come to the uh, discussion about uh, the Khawarij. Now this group was the group that abandoned uh, Imam Ali during the a war of uh, Safin and they formed their own group uh, called Khawarij and um, they led a war against Imam Ali, namely the war of uh, Nahravan. Can you please tell us about that uh, war? Well, the Khawarij were initially, as we are aware, part of the army of Imam Ali. Uh, and in fact, it is important to remember that Imam Ali was not for the arbitration. 
he was forced into it. Because he knew very well that Muawiyah and Amr bin As had particular strategies in mind, which is that they were being defeated and the only way they could stop the rout and the defeat is by putting uh, copies of the Quran at the end of the spears and asking for sulh and asking for a, an agreement, peace, a treaty. If Muawiyah truly did not want to fight, then why did he start the fighting in the first place, even though he was warned repeatedly? In any case, because Imam Ali was forced into this and the arbitration did not work in uh, the favor of Imam Ali, certainly the way that he would have liked it to, the Khawarij abandoned, broke off from Imam Ali. That's why they called the Khawarij, those who exited, those who left. And they had a particular understanding of charisma, by the way. Their understanding was that the charisma and salvation lies in the community, not in the charismatic leader. Mm -hmm. In other words, any person who sins, in their view, has left the community. And anybody who is out of the community is going to go to hell. Because the Khawarij understood themselves to be the Ahlul Jannah, the people of heaven. Therefore, they felt not only that Imam Ali had abandoned the ideals of the Prophet, but that he was no longer part of the Ahlul Jannah, the Ahlul Qibla also, the people of Qibla. And therefore, he was out and therefore shedding his blood was lawful for them. This was an extremely dangerous, an extremist militant movement right at the beginning of Islam. It set the tone, by the way, for further extremism because they would even kill innocent civilians right. in the streets. They would interrogate them, they would interview them. Uh, they would, for example, ask them what is the status of a grave sinner? What, what, um, what is the relation between sins and faith, actions and faith, and so on? And anybody who did not agree with them was subjected to be killed. Uh, this was an extremely dangerous movement, extremely militant movement, and they were killed, they were fought against Imam Ali at, Khayb, at uh, Naharwan. It's interesting also to note that these people were not corrupt as such. They were people who would uh, nahar, stay up uh, awake at night in prayers and fast during the daytime, but also kill Ali ibn Abi Talib. In the name of religion, they committed atrocities in the name of real religion and uh, misinterpreting, abusing uh, the religion itself. Finally, of course, that led to the shahadat of Imam Ali. Ibn Muljam came to Kufa with the sole purpose of killing Imam Ali. So this led to Ibn Muljam killing Imam Ali. What happened was it wasn't only that they killed Imam Ali, they killed the soul of Islam. He as well was a person who was absolutely committed and devoted and dedicated to the cause of uh, Allah and the cause of the Prophet. So much so that Imam Shafi'i, one of the Imams of the Ahlul Sunnah, says that if to love Ali ibn Abi Talib means to be a Rafidi, because Shias were called by the Sunnis, were called Rafidis in medieval times. He says, if to love Ali ibn Abi Talib means to be a Rafidi, then bear witness that I'm the first Rafidi, because I love Ali ibn Abi Talib. With the death of Ali came a void, a vacuum. And perhaps history proved very clearly the vacuum. Because the moment Ali ibn Abi Talib dies, a dynasty begins in the Islamic lands. For the first time, a dynasty with corruption from the top itself. The caliphs were corrupt. Muawiyah, later on Yazid and so on. And I believe Hazrat Fatima had warned them that uh, this would happen that unjust rulers would take over if they didn't choose Ali al Well, absolutely. And uh, this is exactly what happened. And I think that uh, it was a tragedy what happened to Imam Ali. But uh, also the vacuum that was left and the sense of grief and vacuum that the Muslim community is still feeling because that was a black day in Islamic history. It wasn't only the death of Ali. It was the death of the soul of Islam that took place uh, in the mosque of Kufa in Ramadan the 19th of Ramadan. Thank you so much and thank you for all your time. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us and uh, to enlighten us and um, discuss the life of Imam Ali alayhi salam. We have truly benefited and I think I talk on behalf of myself and the viewers. We have truly benefited from your knowledge. Thank you so much. You're most welcome.